Okay, water. We're gonna go through this super quickly um, because this is pretty easy stuff, but it's super important. Water is critical for life. The only place that we know of in, in existence where water exists as a solid, a liquid, and a gas is on Earth, um, for sure. Although, like, Europa is a moon of Jupiter, Titan's a moon of Saturn. Um, you know, Mars has frozen water on it, which is, you know, called ice. Um, could Mars, does, does Mars have water vapor on it? If it does, it's, it's negligible. Um, does Mars have flowing water on it? It used to. Does it have flowing water on it now? It doesn't, but could it have, like, in the soil, sort of a permafrost where some of the water that's frozen in, like, the summertime might become a little bit moist? It, it could. That could create, like, a landslide or kind of like a sludgy thing. But anyway, water, liquid water is crucial to life on Earth, or really anywhere. Nowhere where we found life is there not liquid water. Um, hydrogen bonds are everything. This is showing one water molecule bound to four other water molecules through hydrogen bonds. The maximum that one water can do is four. So this molecule here has the maximum number of hydrogen bonding sites. Picture a diagram where I had this one. So this one's got one, right? It could have three more. This could have three more. And each of those could have three more. So you could have a whole lattice network of waters in the structure formed by these hydrogen bonds, okay? Properties of water due to hydrogen bonds. Cohesion. Water molecules stick together. That's what this picture is showing. Um, surface tension. We'll get to this in a minute like you put the drops of water on a penny and it domes, that's because the water molecules are sticky. Adhesion is water sticking to other substances. The straw analogy, so this is, this is an example. So the way that water comes up a plant, uh, water comes in the plant through the roots, right? The roots dry out, the plant dies. So the tops of leaves have pores called stomata where water can actually evaporate away from the leaf. So picture this tree, this oak, whatever kind of tree it is, that's 20 meters tall. It's a huge tree. And there's one water molecule in a leaf that evaporates away because of the sun and goes away. Well, these little cylindrical vessels that go down the stem of the plant have water and the water molecules stick to each other. That's this, this bond that's called cohesion. And they stick to the sides of the vessel. That's called adhesion. So if one water molecule leaves, the like tug is carried down the entire plant. So if one water molecule leaves the leaves, another water molecule gets sucked inside the roots. And it's that evaporative force, it's called transpiration, that pulls water up the plant. So surface tension, like the doming of water on a penny, cohesion, adhesion are all because water is sticky. Water sticks to itself and water sticks to other things like the inside of the vessels of a straw. When you suck water up a straw, that, that, that's like a negative tension you're sucking up. Same thing with water leaving a tree. That, that suck gets carried down the straw due to um, cohesion. Um, yeah. Surface tension, we've discussed. This is a water strider, the spider. Um, it's hard to break the surface of water because of surface tension, because of cohesion. So the spider has little hairs on its legs, which increase the surface area. It spreads out the pressure of the, of the insect on the water. So it's hard to break the surface. That's called surface tension. It's part is because of cohesion. By the way, all of these are due to hydrogen bonds. High specific heat, you can read the definition. So water absorbs lots and lots of heat. It takes a lot of heat to get water to evaporate. By comparison, rubbing alcohol or hand sanitizer, like we're all very familiar with nowadays, um, has a low specific heat. It evaporates really, really easily. If I put rubbing alcohol or whatever on my hands, give it five seconds, it's, it's evaporated. Water takes more time. Water absorbs lots of heat because to get water to evaporate, you have to break the hydrogen bonds. And to break hydrogen bonds takes lots of heat. By definition, the, it's the amount of heat required to increase one gram of a substance one degree Celsius. Um, water, it, it's as easy to remember, water spe specific heat is one. It takes one calorie, which is a unit of energy, to increase the temperature of one gram one degree Celsius. 
Water absorbs lots of heat because it has to break the hydrogen bonds for it to evaporate. Think about it, if, if our oceans were made of rubbing alcohol, they would evaporate like crazy, right? Um, on a hot day, half the ocean would, would evaporate. Well, water doesn't evaporate easily because it has a high specific heat. Um, these definitions, really quickly, kinetic energy is, is the energy of movement. Um, temperature is just molecules moving. The higher the temperature or thermal energy, the more the molecules move. When you heat things up, the atoms move faster. You've probably heard of the idea of absolute zero, which is negative 273 degrees Celsius. That's the temperature when molecules stop moving, period. There's no molecular motion at all. So you can't get less than that because if no atoms are moving, there's, there's no thermal energy. You, you, know, you can't be colder than that because that's, you know, temperature is movement. If there's no movement, you can't have less than no movement, right? Um, a calorie is just what you, is, is a unit of energy. Um, we measure the energy of food in, in calories too. Just note a calorie in science is the amount of heat required to raise temperature of a substance one, one gram, one degree Celsius. So if I ate a Snickers bar, if that's a thousand calories, that would raise a thousand grams. Um, I guess it would raise a thousand grams, one degree Celsius. The calories in food are actually kilocalories. So a calorie in your Snickers bar is actually a thousand calories in, in reality. We use kilocalories to make the numbers easier to print. But if, if a Snickers bar is a thousand calories, that's actually a million. What's a thousand with three more zeros? That's a million calories, right? I guess I could write this down, but you times it by a thousand, right? So that Snickers bar really has a thousand. It has a thousand calories, is really a million calories because the calories on food is actually a kilocalorie. You don't really need to know that for the AP exam. That's just a fact that makes you feel bad about yourself, right? Okay, this is just showing temperatures. Water heats up way slower than land because water has a high specific heat. So look at the temperatures around cities around the ocean. This is California and one's more inland. The heat of vaporization is kind of the same thing, but it's the heat required to raise or to change a substance from a liquid to a gas to cause it to evaporate. And guess what? Water has a high heat of vaporization. It takes a lot of energy for water to evaporate. Um, the result of this is what's called evaporative cooling. Water, when water evaporates off a surface, it steals heat from the surface. So evaporative cooling cools down the surface where it evaporated. Um, you sweat. Sweating keeps your body temperature cool, right? Because when you sweat away sweat, it cools down your skin. Hand sanitizer makes your hands feel cold because when the stuff evaporates, it steals heat from your skin. So evaporative cooling helps moderate temperatures, um, especially in the summertime because it keeps you from getting too hot um, because the heat is absorbed by the sweat or the liquid evaporating off your skin. Um, ice floats. So this is weird. Think about it. Solids are more dense than liquids. Liquids are more dense than gases, right? This is basic chemistry. Well, ice floats and ice is a solid, water is a liquid. So what's the deal? Um, this picture kind of gives it away. So when you cool water down, picture the water molecules slowing down, coming closer together. Um, as long as it's a liquid, the hydrogen bonds can break and reform and they can kind of get a little bit tighter packed. Once the ice is frozen, the hydrogen bonds are locked in place. It's locked in a, a lattice network, which keeps them sort of rigid. Water is actually the densest at four degrees Celsius. Picture four degrees Celsius looking like this. They're pretty close together, right? Once you get three, two, one, and then zero, the, once it's frozen, the lattice network is locked in place, which makes ice less dense than water, which makes ice float. So here we have a nice little crustacean. Um, if, if a lake freezes in the winter, the ice floats to the top. So the water beneath it is warmer. It's still pretty cold, but it's warmer than the ice. So things that live in lakes don't freeze because the lake freezes from the top to the bottom, not the bottom to the top. Um, this helps stabilize temperatures in bodies of water. Okay, cool. And again, why? Hydrogen bonds. Water dissolves lots of things. Anything ionic, polar, water will either mix with, if not dissolve completely, 
Um, hydrogen bonds are attracted to things that have a partial charge, whether it's polar or ionic. Um, salt, water dissolves salt. Table salt, super easy because water is the universal solvent. Um, just some vocabulary in a solution. So a solution of salt water, what's the solute? The solute's the liquid. Um, nope, back up, said it wrong. The solvent is the dissolving agent. So in salt water, the solvent is water. The solute is what is dissolved. So in salt water, the solute is the salt. So if I have sugar water, the solvent's water, the solute is sugar. An aqueous solution just means the solvent is water. You could have a solvent that's rubbing alcohol or acetone or fingernail polish remover or paint thinner. It can be anything. Um, if the solvent is water, it's an aqueous solution. Your blood is largely water. Your blood is an aqueous solution. This just shows the way that water, so this is table salt. How does water dissolve? Well, water interacts with the Na plus, that plus sign should be here, and the Cl minus to break the ionic attraction to dissolve water. This is just showing a molecule that's mixing with water. Here, the big purple molecule has partial negatives and partial positives, which attract to the dipoles of water. So this thing would mix with water. Vocabulary, hydrophobic like water. So sugar, salt, uh, cotton, cotton, you know, water won't dissolve cotton, but cotton will mix with water. So cotton's hydrophilic. Hydrophobics are oils, <coughs> lipids, fats, things that don't mix with water. A colloid is a, like a suspension, like a solution where you have fine particles, but they're equally distributed. That's not that important a word to you know. Okay, this is this, okay, I told you this is a long chapter, right? So, you know, at, we don't really need to get into Avogadro's number. Um, on the AP exam, they could ask you specific questions that deal with molarity. So the molecular mass is the sum of all the masses of the atoms in the molecule added together. A one molar solution, we you need to know what, what molarity is in terms of solutions. A one molar solution would be the number of moles of a solute in one liter of water, all right? So a one molar solution of glucose, you find the molecular mass of glucose, you weigh out that much glucose and dissolve it in one liter of water. The math here is super simple because the weight of one mole it's just the, the weight of one molecular mass of the molecule. Let, let's, let's do an example here. So if I said determine the molecular weight for glucose, all right, I would need to give you a periodic table um, and you would need to know what the structure of glucose is, all right? Um, I'm gonna answer the question, don't worry, but I, I, here, here's the work for how to do it. So glucose is C6H12O6, that, you should have that memorized. This is really more in chapter three, but glucose as a structure, that's the one you're just gonna know. So there's carbons, there's hydrogens, there's oxygens. There's six carbons. The molecular weight of carbon, look at a periodic table, is 12, I'm rounding. So there's six, there are 12 each, that's 72 grams per mole. Um, there's 12 hydrogens, the molecular mass is one, so that's 12. There's six oxygens, the molecular mass is 16, that's 96. Add these together, you get 180 grams per mole. All right. Um, you need to be able to do that for any molecule. I have to give you the, the molecular formula, um, and you need to have a periodic table, or at least need to tell you what the mass of the atoms is. Um, so if I said make a one molar solution of glucose, what do you do? You take 180 grams of glucose, this blank is 180, and divide it or dissolve it into one liter of water. Okay. Um, so it's 180 over one. What if I asked you to make a two molar solution of glucose? There's many ways you could do it. What if I took 180 grams of water, of, of some sorry, of glucose and dissolved it in half a liter of water? Would that be a two molar solution? Yes, it would. What if you took um, 360 grams in one liter? Is that a two molar solution? Yes, it is. What would the molarity be? Do this in your head. If I gave you 180 grams of glucose 
and dissolved it in two liters of water, what molarity would that be? That would be half, that would be a 0.5 molarity. That's more dilute, right? Because you had twice as much water, right? Um, a one molar solution is 180 over one, right? Um, so if I gave you 180 over half a liter, that's 360, right? So that'd be a two molar solution. Um, okay, cool. pH, water does this thing called the dissolution of water. So this is water. Notice this arrow is double headed. Water will break down into what's called a hydronium ion, which is H plus, and a hydroxide ion, which is OH minus. It's a little more complicated than that. It's actually usually H3O plus, but just think of it in terms of, of this way. Um, water doesn't love to do this. Only, I think it's one in every 10 million molecules of water actually does this. So water loves being H2O. It doesn't love being H plus or OH minus. This just shows what really happens is you have two water molecules and one forms H3O plus and one forms OH minus. That's what really goes on. But in terms of this notation, this works just as well. Um, this would be an acid, H plus, and this would be a base, OH minus. And acids and bases are pretty important. They can wreak havoc on a, on a biological system. Um, acids are things that increase the H plus concentration. Bases are things that reduce the H plus concentration. So let me ask you this. So I said that a base was OH minus, right? This is a base, right? Well, here I said that a base reduces the H plus. So which one is it? Does a base provide OH minus or does a base take away H plus? The answer is both. If I have OH minus and I give you H plus, that forms water. So giving you OH minus, taking away H plus is the same thing, basically, in an aqueous solution, and that's a base. So don't let this confuse you. Acids increase this, bases increase this, or bases can decrease that. Um, the pH scale, these little dots, this didn't convert. So this, so you know the, the brackets in chemistry means concentration. So this is the concentration of H plus. This is the concentration of OH minus. This should be a greater than sign, and this should be a less than sign. So acids have more H plus. Neutral, they're equal. Bases have more OH minus. The pH scale goes from 0 to 14. You know this. And neutral is in the middle. Um, if the concentration of, each, each of, of either of these, so I said it was 1 in every 10 million. 1 in every 10 million is 10 to the negative 7. All right? 10 to the negative 7 is 1 10 million if you make it to a decimal. Notice that was 10 to the negative 7. pH of 7 is neutral. So if I have a water molecule where that's 10 to the negative seven, that's 10 to the negative seven, if they're the same, that's neutral, right? It's when they're different. If you have more of this, it's acidic. If I have more of that, it's basic. So a pH of like six is slightly acidic. A pH of one is really acidic. A pH of eight is slightly basic. A pH of 13 is really basic. You know, in, in movies, when you have things that are really acidic, you know, you burn someone's face off. If it's super basic, that'll kill you too. Put your face in a pH of 13, you're going to not acidify, you're going to basify. Is that a word? You're going to basicify. You're going to burn your skin off. You know, a strong base can burn you too. It's more, I guess it's more dazzling to make it a strong acid. Um, hydrochloric acid, a very strong acid. Single-headed arrow gives you lots of H+. Sodium hydroxide, that'll burn your face off. Very strong base because you get single-headed arrow, lots of hydroxide ions. Um, ammonia, putting your hand in ammonia isn't a great idea, but you know, it won't burn your hand off immediately. It's a, it's a weak base. Just If you get ammonia on your hands, just wash your hands. Um, you're cleaning your floor with ammonia and you get it on yourself, just wash your hands. Um, notice that ammonia accepts H+. Plus. That makes it a base. Notice it's a double-headed arrow, so the reaction goes backwards and forwards, so it's a weak base. This is interesting. So this is NH4+. Plus. Didn't I say nitrogen only forms four, or nitrogen forms three bonds, right? 
well, here it has four mons. That's actually decently stable. It'd rather be in H3, but it can be in H4 plus for a little bit. But if you have the extra hydrogen, that's having an extra proton. Hydrogen is just a, just a proton and an electron. H plus, if hydrogen is a proton and an electron, and I lose the electron, you only have a proton, right? So that's a positive charge. So it's NH4 plus, because you basically added a proton, all right? Carbonic acid, this is super important. Carbonic acid is a weak acid. Carbonic acid, which is H, so the H2CO3 has carbonic acid. Um, it will give off some H plus, not a lot, but it gives off some, so it's a weak acid. Carbonic acid is in your blood. If I take water and mix it with carbon dioxide, you form carbonic acid, and you, you know, in your blood, you have CO2 because your mitochondria produce CO2. So there's carbonic acid in your blood right now, which actually is very important, which we'll see why that is in just a minute. But it's a weak acid because it produces H plus reversibly. Um, so on the formula sheet for the AP bio exam, is this formula this this is super easy don't this this doesn't require formula this is the math here is so easy so if i you know if you multiply exponents you add them together right so if the concentration of h plus times the concentration of oh minus if it's it's always 10 to the negative 14 right so if if the h plus is 10 to the minus 7 and the oh minus is 10 to the minus 7 you add those because you're multiplying them, and it's 10 to the negative 14. So do this in your head. If the H plus was 10 to the minus 3, what would the OH minus be? It'd be 10 to the minus 11, because it had to sum to 14, to negative 14. If the H plus was 10 to the minus 13, the OH minus would be 10 to the minus 1, because they have to add up to negative 14. Okay? One more. If this was 10 to the minus 6, this is 10 to the minus eight, right? Yes, because they had, they had to add up to negative 14, okay? The negative logarithm, all that does is it takes the exponent for the H plus and makes it into the integer, so it's positive. So if the H plus was 10 to the minus three, and I plug that into the negative logarithm, it just makes it a positive three. So if the H plus was 10 to the minus 11, the pH is 11. Now notice that we did that math using the H plus concentration and not the OH minus concentration. That's important. So, I mean, here's the math. Don't worry about math, just know, how, know, know the trick. If the H plus concentration is 10 to the minus seven, the pH is seven. If this were a problem and the H plus was 10 to the minus two, the pH is two. Acidic solutions are between zero and seven, neutral is seven, basic is between seven and 14. Most biological fluids are between six and eight. Your body doesn't really love being acidic or basic to large degrees. If your blood was a pH of eight, you're about to be dead. If it was a pH of 6.8, you're about to be dead. Your blood likes to be 7.4. Between seven and 7.8, you're okay. But beyond that, you're having a really bad day. Um, you're about to die. Um, yeah. Um, so, okay, sample problem. Determine the H plus concentration and OH minus concentration at pH of three, all right? Remember, pH is based upon the H plus concentration. So the answer to this question, the H plus concentration is 10 to the minus three. The OH negative concentration would be 10 to the minus 11. Let's do another one. If the pH were 10, if this number was 10, this number is 10 to the minus 10. This number is 10 to the minus 4. All right, let's do a hard one. What is the pH if the OH concentration is 10 to the minus 2? Went, went ahead. If this number was 10 to the minus 2, that means the pH is 12. If this is 10 to the minus 2, this is 10 to the minus 12 which means the pH is 12, okay? One more. If the OH was 10 to the minus five, if this was 10 to the minus five, this would be 10 to the minus nine, so the pH would be nine. Did I do that right? Five and nine is 14, yeah, okay? So if this is 10 to the minus five, the pH is nine. 
right? Yes. So three important notes, we measure pH in terms of H plus concentration. Um, and this is important as the pH decreases, the H plus concentration increases. So people think that if the pH goes up, that means it's more acidic because your brain thinks that way. If the pH goes up, you're increasing the basicity. So making it more acidic is the pH going down. Making it less acidic is the pH going up. And this last point, we haven't said this before, this is super important. Every pH unit is a tenfold increase. So if I go from a pH three to a pH of four, you made it 10 times more basic, all right? What if you went from pH three to a pH of five? Going from three to five, you went two pH units. That's a hundred times difference. Every time you do it is a factor of 10. So sample question, how many times more acidic is pH two compared to pH of five? Compare two and five. Well, two, three, four, five, that's three pH units difference. A one with three zeros is a thousand. So a pH of two is a thousand times more acidic than a pH of five, okay? If, that were, if, if it were multiple choice, and the question was comparing pH two to pH four, comparing two to four, that's a hundred times difference, right? What would one choice be for sure? One choice for sure would be 20. That'd be the most common wrong answer because if you go two to four, kids remember each one's a factor of 10, but they forget that you times it by 10. So like comparing two to four, people are gonna say it's 20 because that's two tens, but it's actually 100. So say you go from six to nine. Six to nine is a thousand times difference, but one of the choices would be 30, because kids think each one's 10, three tens is 30, but you multiply it. This is just showing a pH scale, battery acid. Don't drink battery acid, it's very acidic. Bleach is very, very basic, don't drink bleach. Um, milk of magnesia, you might take if you have heartburn. Um, it's an antacid, because if you have heartburn, that's acidic, so take milk of magnesia, it'll help neutralize the, the acid. Um, urine is usually slightly acidic, Soda, soda's pretty acidic, so too much soda can definitely be bad for your teeth. Um, basic has more OH minus, neutral, they're equal, acidic has more H plus. Buffers, okay, let's wrap up this chapter. So buffers are substances that help minimize changes in pH. So this is called the carbonic acid buffer system. This is what's in your blood. So this is important. Um, don't memorize this, but the AP exam could give it to you and ask you questions about it. So H2CO3 is carbonic acid. If I go forward, forward is acidic because you give off H+. Backwards is basic because you take H+, right? How do I make carbonic acid? I think I said this earlier. If I mix CO2 in water, you make carbonic acid. So just in, in inhaling and exhaling, you're making carbonic acid in your blood because you're breathing in CO2 and your cells produce CO2, okay? So let me ask you a question. So what would happen, think this through in your head, what would happen to your blood pH? Let's do an, an inquiry question. If you stopped breathing, if you were suffocating yourself, which don't do, or if you stopped breathing, what would happen to your blood pH? Would it get more acidic or would it get more basic? Now, if you're not breathing, your cells are still producing CO2, right? If you're not exhaling CO2, what happens to the CO2 levels in your blood? If, you're not, if you aren't exhaling, they're going up. If the CO2 of your blood is going up, you're making carbonic acid. If you make lots of this, you're pushing the reaction that way. So your blood becomes more acidic. So if you stop breathing, stop exhaling, your blood pH gets more acidic, all right? Um, eventually you would pass out and you would die, all right? Um, you know, if, if you do suffocate yourself, you know, you pass out before you die because that's, you know, your body can monitor your blood pH. Your body is very smart. And your body can tell if your blood pH is getting too acidic 
that means your CO2 levels are, are, are building up and your body will, you'll pass out, you'll faint. Your body will say, whatever you're doing, stop doing it. It'll shut you down before you're, you're dead. Um, that's called acidosis. If your blood pH gets too acidic, alkalosis is if it's, if it gets too basic, rising CO2 levels, increase the acidity of your blood. As long as you're breathing out, you're, you're okay normally. Um, I said that if, if, if you're, if you're not breathing out CO2, you eventually pass out and die. So if, if you know, I Googled this earlier, if you know the story behind um, the Apollo 13 accident. So if, if you're in a spacecraft that's sealed, you know, astronauts exhale CO2, they use oxygen. So in the spacecraft, CO2 levels go up, right? And there's no way of getting rid of the CO2, the astronauts would pass out and they would die. So space capsules have what are called CO2 scrubbers. Um, again, I, I Google this. A CO2 scrubber, it's a, it's a device that you plug in the wall. I'm looking at pictures. Um, this, is, this is showing these from an Apollo capsule. You plug them in the wall in like, a, in like an adapter, and it's a chemical reaction that takes the CO2 out of the atmosphere of the capsule. So the astronauts don't pass out and die. You know, you have O2 tanks to give you oxygen. You can have plenty of oxygen. But if you're not removing the CO2, you're going to kill the astronauts. Well, in the Apollo 13 accident, we're not going to get into the story behind this. You can Google it yourself. If you want to know, take astronomy. But the, the lunar lander, so there was an explosion. The astronauts end up in the lunar lander. They're still in space. And the command module had CO2 scrubbers that were shaped like a square. And the lunar module had CO2 canisters, that's this right here, shaped like a circle. And basically, the lunar lander is designed to support like two astronauts for a couple hours on the moon, but you had three astronauts in the lunar lander for like a couple of days. Um, and the astronauts were going to die of CO2 poisoning. But the problem was like the command module adapters were square and the lunar adapters were round and they couldn't, they didn't fit in the wall the right way. Um, so they had to mock up in orbit this adapter. And the story, it's a great story. They basically, I mean, they couldn't go back to Earth and like go to Lowe's and get supplies. They, they had to use what they had on hand. And this is the adapter. Like you see how it has a round part and a square part? This is the scrubber. They use duct tape. They use a sock for one of the astronauts. I think, they, I think they used part of a cardboard box. And they had to build this adapter thing to plug a square thing into a round hole to get the CO2 scrubber to fit in the lunar module. And it worked, the CO2 levels came down. They obviously, you know, no one died in Apollo 13, but it's a great story about overwhelming the carbonic acid buffer system of your blood. Um, so they wouldn't pass out and die. Too much CO2 in the water will cause the oceans to become more acidic. Um, you know, greenhouse gases produce CO2. They are CO2 burning fossil fuels. We've, we've learned this before. Too much CO2, look at the reactions. This is carbonic acid. Too much CO2 forms carbonic acid, makes the oceans more acidic. That will dissolve coral reefs, make seashells not form. You kill life in the ocean. You know, if you, if you screw with the ocean's pH, that's just a bad thing for life on Earth. And too much CO2 will make the oceans too acidic. Um, yeah, okay, so that was chapter two. That was a very, very, very long chapter. Um, I hope that was helpful, and I will see y'all next time. Bye.